Welcome to Brota GP. This is another episode of R&D Writing Analysis with Rob and Dennis. It's been, what, two months and a week since we last recorded one of these? This is number four. Dennis has accomplished quite a bit of writing, and we have a lot to cover. So why are you, why are you laughing at yourself already? Uh, that, I think that, I mean, accomplished a lot. Jeez, man. <laughs> <laughs> I want to call it that, but all right. You know, we made, uh, made some progress, okay? We made some progress. All right, I'm going to play the intro video now. Yeah, we made plenty of progress. Um, okay, so if you've never seen one of these video, one of these videos before, uh, this is where I talk about that guy's writing right <laughs> down below me somewhere, and we're gonna guy. use we're gonna use this data analysis software that is over there, huge on the screen, mm -hmm. um, to analyze his writing. And I actually even have some video for you today with a little bit more data on it. Um, overlays, overlays, overlays. Yeah, so that chunk of software right over there is uh, AIM, what is it, what's it actually called? AIM Race Studio race. or Race Analysis, um, race RS2, studio. Race Studio Analysis, Race Analysis, flubbing it already. I thought it was um, just Race Studio, man. Yeah, they have, they have a second and a third one now. The analysis software is no different, yeah, whether you have the... Uh, the new AIM Solo or the older one. Oh, and that is the other thing that we should probably tell you. Dennis has been using the AIM Solo 2 to record mm -hmm. his his data. Um, he actually had a problem with it at the track called well, up first of AIM. all, before that, I, already, I actually got two friends to buy Solo 2s for themselves. So, hey, I think we should be getting sponsored by AIM at this point, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, I could use a new. I, I could use like a DL or maybe like Seriously, an Evo, right? Evo yeah. 5 data, record, yeah. data logger. Yeah. yeah, that would be nice yeah Sh shameless plug there but yeah um, i did i did have some problem because i'm i'm so bad at updating my i guess the form the firmware on it so mm -hmm. yeah i i went to turn it on after charging it overnight and it just wouldn't it seemed like it wouldn't come on because nothing was happening when i would whenever i would turn on the or press the power button um yeah so it, so what'd you do well you told me to call them, <laughs> so I did. <laughs> I did because it was a weekday, right? It was it was a weekday, and and they told me that actually it was on. It was just stuck in like boot up mode, so it would never get to the point where it would show me or it would, it would turn on the screen. So I had two choices, which was basically to let it uh, to unplug it from its power source or let it deplete the battery as as it kept trying to boot up. And I was like, fuck it, let me just pop it open and unplug the battery, and it worked like a charm. Did you void your warranty? I Did asked him about. With a I asked him about that. And he said, "No, no, no," because it was such a, you know, it was fortunately the common, um, the common issue that uh, users were having. So they said, "No, they, you know, that's the same thing that they would do if I sent it in for for warranty work." So, did you? Uh, you since updated the firmware, and that's not going to happen again, right? Yeah, I mean, it was fine after I plugged it back in and used it for the rest of the day. The day, and then I think I up I updated the firmware when I got home after that event. Awesome. All right, so obviously all these all these fancy devices can come with technical difficulties, um, but the uh, one of the reasons why we both like the AIM products is because they generally just work. So and even even like Dennis had to unscrew like five or six screws, unplug a battery, plug it back in, and and again return to just working. Yep. Um, so yeah, good pieces of hardware, and now we're gonna look at the software. So the lap that we're gonna cover today is actually from September twenty second. Um, and this is your lap right here. So Dennis has a goal of um, around Thunder Hill of beating a of beating two flat. So two minutes zero seconds zero fractions of a second. I, I want to see fifty nine. I don't care. It's fifty nine dot nine 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 nine. As long as I see fifty nine, I'm happy. <laughs> And not two be... five nine one five nine. <laughs> yeah, exactly one one five nine. Uh, we'll get you there eventually. But so so I brought up the track map here just so you can see Thunder Hill. Uh, it's a, a racetrack in Northern California. Dennis has been there countless times. Honestly, I think at this point the fact that he's been there so much is actually hurting his writing and his ability to improve. But that's not something that we're going to get into today. Tough love. I know. God. <laughs> All right. So. Before we before we go into the data, like with that visualization with all those graphs, I'm gonna show you this little video of Dennis writing. So this this uh, this is his single lap. This lap is exactly 
what was uh, what was displayed there on the data. And I actually added some overlays to it. So let's go ahead and look at that right now. Hopefully it's not too loud. It's it not. <clears throat> so yeah, Dennis Got coming down the front straight now. away. Are you going to narrate your lap? Do you want to do that? No, I can like, it's so pixelated, so you do it. <laughs> on the brakes, coming into turn one. Gets off the brakes. We're gonna talk about you getting off the brakes. So, so let's let's let me talk about the data overlays while we're while we're watching this. Um, in the top left hand corner, we obviously have the track map, the little white dot of him going around the track. Next to that, we have his uh, lap timer, effectively showing you how far he's been through the lap. But down in the bottom left hand corner is something that uh, I find to be much more interesting. So that's like a G plotter. So that shows you exactly the g-forces that the data logger is recording as he's going around the racetrack. So if the little red dot goes up to the top, that means he's braking. If it goes off ah. to the right... Hmm? I see it. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably even on your pixelated screen, it's probably more difficult yeah. to see. <laughs> but so, so that g-plot is actually something that we're gonna... That's what we're gonna get into today for the analysis. Um, you can kind of see those without doing math channels, but I'm going to show you how to do math channels real quick. And uh, once this lap is done, I don't know, Dennis, how'd you feel about this lap? This was towards the end of the day, right? Yeah, and actually, let me preface this by uh, saying that I, I mean, it may sound cliche, but I had no, I didn't think that I was going to be able to set a new PB that day because it wasn't our regular track day that, that event was added to our calendar at the last minute it was actually a track masters uh track day event track masters provides car track days and um mm. they just wanted us to fill in some of the spots so they agreed to have one motorcycle group so it's a car track day with just one motorcycle group typically we do two bikes two car groups this one only had one bike group so i was wary because i mean there was only one group it was going to be like a just a mishmash of like skill level so we'll sign up for that one group and then we would still have the instructors and then there's us so i was like this is going to be traffic galore all day is what i expected so i i didn't have any high hopes of setting a new pb if i could be honest um i i love how you said like traffic galore and i think i saw two other riders on that entire lap right because i mean <laughs> i mean if you looked at my that session right what is what lap is this like fifth fifth or fifth or fourth or something or maybe even it sixth? was i think it was the fifth lap yes right so i was i knew that if i was going to have a chance at a clear track not only was going to be towards the end of the day but also um you know towards the the later part of that session when the the people or the riders have kind of dispersed around the track and i i felt like this one lap that i set a new pv was probably like one of three or four clear laps that i had the whole day for the whole day yeah so here let me let me give you a little piece of advice for finding clear track and i actually just discovered this recently because okay. i actually don't spend that much time at track days so it's not something that i've had to practice i also like a couple of years ago i started hating track days for the exact <laughs> problems that you've been describing right yeah. when when you're 10 seconds a lap faster than everyone you can pass individual riders but getting around a pack of 10 of them just is is difficult unsafe mm -hmm. and you kind of like i don't know i've tried it before and i, I come off feeling like a dick like yeah. trying to dive up the inside of people and passing around the outside and whatnot so the last time i was out on track was at chukwala um for just for a for a track day and in one of the sessions like i could never get out early um to be the first one out and yeah. i don't think that really would have mattered what I did in one of the sessions was at Chukwala, you can see the entire track. Mm -hmm. Like it kind of like loops around. It's a little bit uphill in the very back. And then it comes back and, and obviously, you know, we're along the front straightaway. I waited for what was effectively two minutes for the first rider in the group to make it to the last corner. Yeah. And then I went. No. <laughs> yeah, I kind of applied the same at Thunder Hill because at Thunder Hill at the pit, at the, um, at the hot pits, you know, next to the adjacent to the front straight. From there, you could still see the back straight that leads into turn 14 and 15. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I just kind of waited until there was a little bit of silence at the back straight and then waited for the last bike to pass in the front straight before I would get out. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it just, and, and being able to do that, like, really can maximize the amount of time yeah, that you can absolutely. spend at working on your laps. Obviously, for the stuff that you're working on, you definitely 
you probably need some clear track. Like, I don't think at most of your track days you have someone to get a tow from or a faster racer or anything. Cause, right, cause... for the most part on an average track day, I, I don't have a problem with traffic uh, in A group. You know, um, I think, mm -hmm. you know, this particular day was just because we there was only one bike group in a car track day. So it, it was just a given there was going to be traffic the whole time. Yeah, I, I don't know how you did it. I would have. <laughs> I don't know how you did it. All right, let's uh let's get into the data though. Into the data. God, I can talk. All right. So, um this is this is Dennis's GPS speed. Over here on the left, we have a bunch of other uh readings from the uh from the data logger. And actually, if I click on lateral acceleration and longitudinal acceleration and turn off GPS speed, these two plots were are what was showing in that um, in the little G meter. So in the circle with the red dot that moved around, yeah. this is the data that was showing there. Um, so, so this drives how that little red dot moves in that little circle. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So you're. Uh, so let's let's change the scale a little bit here. Um, yeah, so the, the cool thing about this data is it tells you everything that you need to know about how the motorcycle was leaning, how the motorcycle was turning, how hard you were braking, and how hard you were accelerating. But it's very difficult to read in this form, yeah. right? There's no distinction between each turn there or like between right and left. There's no distinction between positive acceleration and negative acceleration. So what we're going to do here is where we get into math channels. These are the simplest math channels that you can do, um, but math channels are very, very powerful. Um, we're going to take these two plots. We're going to turn them into braking, acceleration, and lean angle in three separate plots. Jeez. So yeah, right. But, but it's going to be way more helpful than, than what we're reading up here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here to modify and I'm going to click math channels. <coughs> this little dialog is going to pop up. And then what we see here is kind of just a list of, well, actually that's, that's kind of a bad way to explain it. This is essentially just like a calculator right here. So if we go over to general, um, I can kind of click on some of these things and, oh, actually these are the ones that I already did. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so let's, uh, let's start with, uh, I've created these ones previously. Um, this is breaking G. Um, if you see down here at the bottom, we have a formula <clears throat> and let's, let's, uh, let's start a new one. Let's just, let's just call this new one test just to show you how all this stuff can work. <clears throat> so if I want to create a new math channel, I, I, click insert, I click the name button, I change the name to whatever I want. Um, you don't necessarily have to change this stuff in the first column here. Everything that you really care about is down here. So all of these things, all these identifiers are stuff that you can actually get from the data. Uh, actually, there's some of them are missing. Where did they go? Hmm. I thought you said you already created this. Did you already use them? No. It shouldn't matter. Mm. Oh, it's probably, I know why. Cause it's in, cause we're in general. We're gonna delete test. Yes, we're gonna go over here. Okay, this makes more sense. So I've now, I've now switched from general and I've moved over back to the actual data from the lap that we've been looking at. Right. And now if you notice our identifiers have changed. So now we have specific GPS identifiers. So I can literally, let's, let's create a new one. We'll, we'll call it test again. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pick any one of these things. Let's pick the simplest one. We'll cut GPS speed and, and this formula down here at the bottom, I can literally just do anything I want related to math and you, uh, click test channel and all right. So what I, all I did this, this test math channel now is literally just GPS speed plus 100. So if I were to like, I can click this. It shows, I can click OK. It shows over here on the left. I turn it on. I double click this to change the scale. And now look, Dennis, it says that you went 248 miles an hour. What? It's, it's coming. Just wait for it. What? I'm going to turn off. <clears throat> so, so remember, the, the math channel definition that I made and I'm, I'm doing yeah. something absurd just, just for the heck of it, yeah, yeah. is GPS speed plus 100. Right. So it, it gave me that data. Right. Obviously for, for more important or for, for the actual math, we're going to do much more, we're going to do more complicated things than that. 
Um, but but this is just me trying to show you what the formula does down here at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I'm gonna delete this. I'm going to import my previous set of math channels, and I'm gonna let's let's run you through them. So uh, the one that we'll probably use most often is breaking G. So this takes the negative of our GPS longitudinal acceleration and it figures out the maximum between that negative and zero. Our cornering G is the absolute value of the GPS lateral acceleration. That mm -hmm. one we'll use quite a bit. Our acceleration G is the opposite of the braking G. It's mm -hmm. the positive GPS longitudinal acceleration and zero and the maximum between those two. And I'm gonna, don't worry, like, I will, I will post all of these formulas in the description for the YouTube video so that no one has to remember them right now. I actually right. got all this data from uh, from Andrew Trevitt's old website. Yeah, you know, I was going to ask you on behalf of our <laughs> listeners who are probably stuck somewhere between me, who don't give a <laughs> shit about this, and you who, yeah, comprehensively do, how did you, how did you even come to know what you're playing with in this software? The, the math channel thing always made sense to me. Um, so How? finding it and it, it, I'm an engineer at heart, right? Like ah. manipulating data and transforming data and, and just figuring out what this stuff means before using it is just something that clicks for me. Like, yeah. I mean, my entire college education was based on that. I took a lot of math and science and physics in high school. Like it just all worked for me. However, there are a few places across the internet and a couple of books where you can get this information. Um, most of them, there, there are only a few because those people don't like to give away information for free, right? Sure. It's intellectual property. They need to be paid for this stuff, sure. but there are a few places. Yeah. So the one, and actually the one website that I found years ago, you can't, isn't even up anymore. You have to go on the Wayback machine, which is like a, just a record of the entire internet and you uh -huh. can find it there. Um, but I, I of course copied it and made a document for it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that, that helps with, that helps with the formulas, obviously interpreting so the formula is a bit more time, complicated. Until such time as you and I monetize this, we're the ones giving this information out for free. Yeah, that's yeah, pretty much true. Oh, <laughs> that's not sitting well with me. It's okay because this, honestly, the stuff that I'm going to be explaining so that everyone can take advantage of it yeah. is not it's it's not what someone is charging like a hundred thousand dollars a year to do for a moto america pro or okay. you know moto gp or world superbike right it's like They're, a tip of the iceberg of that right exactly this is the Got beginner it. tip of the iceberg we did we did all the other non-math channel related stuff um in previous videos not all of them but some of them and then now i'm i'm just this is the tip of the iceberg obviously yeah. if we were to like if your data logger had suspension potentiometers, had RPM, had gear indicators, like we could do so much more or wheel speed sensors. That would be unbelievably helpful too. Um, but we're just going to look at the GPS data because I know that the solo one and the solo two both offer that. And you can actually infer a reasonable amount of data from it. Okay. Um, the last one that we'll probably look at too is the lean angle. And this one is a bit more complicated. Uh, you have to turn the lateral acceleration or you have to take the arc tangent of the lateral acceleration. Then you turn it into radians. Then you take, or you turn it into degrees. Then you take the absolute value of it. But all right, I'm going to hit okay on this. And all these things over here on the left are going to pop up. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So for the lean angle, you're, you're, you're getting that information strictly from... Because there's there's really no gyro in my solo too, right? There there is actually. There is. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, but it is. Yeah, so there are. Your solo two is more advanced. Um, the solo one does not have a gyroscope in it, and actually doesn't allow you access to the okay. accelerometers. Uh, the right. solo two does. Um, this this lean angle is effectively using the GPS data to calculate the lean angle. Um, so since we're talking about that one, we'll, let's go to that one first. Okay. <clears throat> Actually we'll do, we'll, we'll pop the acceleration G on here as well. All right. Uh, so lean angles at the bottom and it shows us that you had a maximum of 55 degrees of lean angle. What? So that's it. 55. I mean, Marquez gets to 63. 55 is a solid number. That's eight behind Marquez. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so so this lean angle is actually not it's not perfect. Because this is coming from the GPS data, yeah. what this is using is the uh radius it's it's using the acceleration of you going around a corner mm -hmm. to approximate what your lean angle should be, right? Because okay. yeah. we know that, yeah, we know that every for any corner at a given speed, you have to have a certain amount of lean angle, right? To make that, it, yeah, exactly. That certain amount of lean angle is that lean angle is actually your effective lean angle. It's the lean angle from the the um how to how to say this. No, that's that's your theoretical lean angle. It's it's literally like if you had infinitesimally narrow tires mm -hmm. and that was where your contact patch was and then that went up to the center of gravity of both the rider and the motorcycle combined, that's what your theoretical lean angle is. That's not the lean angle of the motorcycle. Obviously, because you hang mm -hmm. off, the lean angle yeah. of the motorcycle could be less. Right. The lean angle of your body is a little bit more. Mm -hmm. There are also other effects because your tires don't have infinitesimal width. Like they're not that narrow. They actually, especially the rear tire is quite wide. Um, so the lean angle of the motorcycle is different. Like if you had really uh, advanced traction control, it would not be using this lean angle to calculate anything. Okay. It would use, it would use the real one. All right. Um, but yeah, we're, uh, okay. We're, we're running out of time here, but let's, uh, <laughs> Let's do let's do just a little bit of stuff here. So lean angles complicated. So I'm gonna turn on let's let's drag this down here. And hmm hmm what to show. Actually no, we'll turn on we'll go back to this. Alright. So so one thing to notice here for acceleration and lean angle, one thing that I like to look at first is just for big mistakes. So mm. I want to know if you remove lean angle before applying the throttle. I would like to know that too, actually. You would like to know that, right? I would like to know that too. <laughs> <laughs> so let's so let's zoom in a little bit and let's see if we can find out. Okay. Um where's a good should we just go to turn one? <clears throat> uh, turn one, one or one or two. Two, two is probably a case where you, uh, yeah, actually one and two, one and two are both right here. So that's good. We'll cover these and then we'll probably have to call it a day and, and, uh, and move on. Yep. But all right. So, so turn one, here's where your acceleration starts about halfway through the may, maybe a little more than halfway through the corner. Mm -hmm. Um, you decided to pick up the throttle just a little bit and unfortunately you didn't take a whaling angle right away. Uh, so wait, um, I see a couple of uh, uh, peaks and valleys. Which one is lean angle? Which one is acceleration? The one on the top is your acceleration. All right. Right. Um, so it's any any speed increase will cause that. The one on the bottom is that the theoretical lean angle that we were talking about. Okay. Okay. So there is a small spike here in your theoretical lean angle where you got on the gas. You mean that it's spike that looks like a middle finger? <laughs> Yeah, this one right here that the that the thing is highlighted over. Exactly. All so right. you you touched the throttle. Mm -hmm. That caused your speed to increase ever so slightly. Mm -hmm. And because that, you probably tried to hold the motorcycle in the corner. And then because you tried to hold the motorcycle in the corner and your speed increased, your lean angle had to increase. Mm -hmm. So right now, I mean, it's based on these rough calculations, it's saying you went from 43 degrees lean angle back to 52 degrees because of that acceleration. During of the course, time I was getting on the throttle? Correct. Okay. It's There is some fudge factor here. There needs to be a little more smoothing. That's probably not the actual values. Um, but this does suggest that you did not open your line, did not reduce your lean angle while getting on the throttle. Which you don't like, right? You want that to be a smooth line as far as taking away the lean angle. Yeah, I want for most corners, like for, for your standard corner where you have a really hard drive out of it, yeah. you would want to see the speed increase and the lean angle decrease at exactly the same time, mm. not to have this little spike. Basically, they're um, kind of, they're falling away from each other is what you want to see. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for turn one is quite a long corner, as is turn two. So these two corners, it's we can fudge that slightly. Mm. Um, but even still, like you just want to be a little patient. 
Um, we can look at the, the same thing happened in turn two. You, you crack the throttle to kind of get back to maintenance throttle. It looks like you cracked it a little too hard and you kind of rolled back off and decreased your speed some, but that well, first initial the, crack. That's the recurring theme with the, with the fly-by-wire throttle on the R1, right? Like it, to me, it's still so sensitive that I still have to be even more gentle getting mm -hmm. back on it. Yeah, I find Ooh. myself still lurching every now and then. Who flashed it? Do you have a flash in the ECU? Uh, the word from the previous owner is jet tuning. <laughs> okay. But I, I have no paperwork or anything. Yeah, so I mean, it might just be... That, that is something in a fly-by-wire motorcycle that you can adjust a little bit um, with, the, with the ECU settings, with the flash. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, there could be other things to change, right? Maybe you need to loosen the throttle cables just a little bit. Maybe you need to tighten them a little bit. Um, there, it is something to work on, though, because obviously the, the smoother you can get to the throttle, the cool. sooner you can get to the throttle, the less the tire spins. Right. If, if you find that it's actually lurching, um, that's not, yeah, we want to, we definitely want to fix that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So a tiny little lurch, you rolled back off it. Then you kind of hovered around maintenance throttle. There was a tiny bit of acceleration, a little bit of slowing. Like I doubt your speed here changes that much at all. So if we look at the actual speed plot, um, it wavers by two miles an hour. So the the low point was right here. And actually, and we can, the acceleration plot also helps us to find where those low points are and where those high points are. Um, so we can see this is, the low point here on the left is 70 miles an hour. And the high point here in the middle of the turn is 72 miles an hour. So nice fast corner. Yeah. Um, and then finally, this right here is the point at which you go, all right, we can finally exit the corner. So you were still cruising around maintenance throttle. And then you start taking away lean angle, start taking away turning radius. It reduces this theoretical lean angle that you got here, and you start you, the majority of your acceleration. Looking at these plots, I have no idea if this is a good acceleration yet because I haven't seen that many of yours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we'll we'll get there. <clears throat> All Did right. Did it at least look um, better than turn one? What? Did it at least look better than turn one coming out of turn one? Yeah, and... Mm, <laughs> hmm. You don't shift between two and three, do you? Uh, between two and no, I do not. Yeah, so it looks like there's a tiny there's a tiny lull in the acceleration here where you like wound the throttle on and then kind of like saying that I should shift. No, no, it, it just looks more like you should hold wide open throttle more and sooner. Mm. Like this is probably wide open throttle. Maybe this lull right here, this little dip in the acceleration curve, maybe that was due to um, like you repositioning your hand or something. Should we go look at the Should we go look at the video one more time? I hate that now. Like even just like what I do with my hands when I'm riding is like exhibited in the in the data. It's like like I said, <laughs> okay, I feel so naked on a stage right now. Oh man! All right, let's let's go look at the data. Let's go look at the video one more time. Let's see if it loads easily. We're just, and I'll stop it. I'll stop it after turn two. Okay. One thing that I do notice here too is I question if you're coming off the brake too quickly. I, I mean, I, I would, I would have already agreed with you before you questioned it. Really? Yeah. Oh, all right. More things we can work on. There was turn one. And turn two. Nice smooth on the brake. Here's turn two. There's your like roll on the throttle and then roll off. You see the you see the little shadow change on your hand? Yeah. And then that's you rolling on and oh, did you go to full throttle? I don't know. I can't tell oh. because it's such it's the Yamaha <laughs> reel. It's so big, like it's almost like a quick turn throttle, man. Oh man, it should be a quick turn throttle. Yeah. I have the shortest one on my bike. Yeah. Oh man. All right. Uh, yeah. This has already been too long, Dennis. So let's uh, let's let's close this one off now. Um, we're gonna pick back up in uh, R&D episode number five. And uh, we'll do a little bit more of this lap and then we'll actually talk about another really fast lap that Dennis set uh, since the last time we uh, we looked at it's his new Pete. It's still not best. fast enough. It's still not fast <laughs> enough. He's so sad about it. All right, everyone. Uh, thanks for watching. Like, share, and subscribe on YouTube. And uh, I'm sorry, this, this episode just been like kind of scatterbrained. We will do better next time. I will go over a little bit more of the math channels and we'll do some more hard-hitting analysis. Right. Thanks for watching. Peace. Later.